Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala Rasulillah. Let's begin. Uh, go ahead, uh, Yasir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qal al-mu'allifu rahimahullah. Kun rayi qalbi ishri inna al-hurra himmatuhu sahifatun wa alayha al-bishru anwanu wa rafiki al-rifqa fi kulli al-umuri falam Yandam rafiqu wa lam yadhmumhu insanu So he begins by saying, and have a, a countenance that is welcoming for the best, have joy on their faces like a headline on a page, and accompany gentleness in all affairs, for it has never been the cause of regret or outrage. Have a countenance that is welcoming. Have bishr. Bishr is when a person sees you, and you are cheerful in their presence. When a person sees you and you make them feel warm and welcome. And when you do that, you bring happiness to them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi says in Sahih Muslim, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا He says, do not belittle any good that you can do, even if you simply meet your brother with wajhin talq, with a face that is Joyous. That is a sadaqah that you give. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Tabassumuka fi waji akhik sadaqa. And I think we've all experienced moments where you've met somebody and they were so happy to see you that it made you feel good. And then you can have the opposite where you might be excited to meet somebody and then when you go to meet them, they give you such a lukewarm gr greeting that it, it sucks out your energy and it sucks out your, your, your happiness even. And so the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu says, don't belittle any good deed that you can do, even if it's just that you meet a person and you meet a person with a good, a, a good, a good energy. You meet them with happiness. And I've seen some people who are enamored by people. They are, uh, whether they were diplomats or whether they were people who are just very, very popular for many different reasons and some of them were just masters at making you feel welcomed and making you feel loved and so when the prophet وسلم, is so warm to amr ibn al-as the amr ibn al-as he's like he, rasulullah must love me more than anybody else like look at the way he greets me look at the way he talks to me look at the way he smiles at me and so amr ibn al-as became certain that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa loved him more than anybody else. I'm, I'm amazed at how, how much cheerfulness and how much happiness and how much warmth the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa must have been communicating to Amr for Amr to feel that way. So Amr, even though he's a shrewd politician, like he's not somebody who is, who is, who is, who is, who is um, who's deceived by people's faces. Amr was convinced. And he says, I just want everybody else to know. So he, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ in front of everybody and he says, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most beloved person to you? And Rasulullah ﷺ says, Aisha. And Amr goes, hold on a second. No, no, that's not who I mean. I'm talking about the men, the men. I want everybody to know, like, who is the most, because it's obviously him. And the Prophet ﷺ says, her father. And then he goes, and then, and then who? He goes, and then Umar. And then Amr is like, okay, hold on a second. I obviously misread this whole situation. Let me just backtrack from this. But that is how much the Prophet Sallallahu him showcased. And, and when you meet people like that, it's really a beautiful experience. They make you feel so beloved and make you feel so warm. And the secret to that is a smile. The secret to that is a smile. My question for you is, is do you like your smile? And even if you don't like your smile, people like your smile. Rasulullah said that it's a charity that you give. And so practicing that smile because it's something that you give to other people. And I'm sure you all, even before that, Rasulullah, that smile that denotes warmth cracks through even the hardest exteriors. There's nobody here who's tougher than Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. He is Sayfullah al-Masrul. He is the unsheathed sword of God. He was a warrior par excellence. He never lost a battle in his life and he participated in over a hundred of them. So if there's anybody who's a man's man who's as tough as they come, it's Khalid radiallahu anhu. And yet Khalid says that when he accepted Islam, 
and he came to Medina, his brother was already, he told him, the Prophet ﷺ has heard of your arrival, he's overjoyed, and he's waiting for you. And so Khalid has to go right away to meet him وسلم, and he does. And he says, the memory that stayed with him is he said, When he saw me from a distance, the Prophet ﷺ, he smiled at me. By Allah, that smile of his was unbroken until I stood in front of him. Like from a distance, Rasulullah is smiling at Khalid. He's beaming at him. And he says, that smile was unbroken until I stood and I, I, I was in front of him. When you smile at a person, a smile that denotes warmth and comfort and safety and security and love, then it becomes a charity that you give. So then he says, he says, and what does he say? He says, no, hold on. He says, and accompany gentleness in all affairs, for it has never been the cause of regret or outrage. You want to read the warafiq? وَرَافِقِ الرِّفْقَ فِي كُلِّ الْأُمُورِ فَلَمْ يَنْدَمْ رَفِيقٌ وَلَمْ يَذْمُمْهُ إِنْسَانٌ So accompany gentleness in all affairs because a person who is gentle never regrets their gentleness and a person who is gentle is never criticized for their gentleness. So as far as at times where a person has regretted gentleness versus regretted being aggressive or being harsh. Undoubtedly, a person who will regret being harsh way more than the amount of times that they'll regret gentleness. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Those who are merciful will experience mercy from Ar-Rahman. Have mercy on those on earth. The one who is in the heavens will have mercy on you. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, gentleness is never added to anything except that it beautifies it. And it is never taken away from anything except that it uglifies it, makes it hideous, makes it disfigured. And so adding gentleness and challenging yourself to, gentle, to be gentle. And when are you required to be gentle? When you're calm and cool and collected or when you're upset? Of course, if it was when you're calm and cool and collected, then we'd all, we'd all pass that. That's no big deal. It's easy to do that. But when, you, when you're upset, that's when it's time for you to be gentle. And when you have the ability to, to, to extract vengeance, that's when it's time for you to be gentle. And when you can really hurt this person, and when you can really, when you can really abuse this person, this person is younger than you, this person is smaller than you, this person is weaker than you, this person is whatever it is, you can take advantage of this person. That's when it's time for you to be gentle. And a person won't, inshallah ta'ala, regret that gentleness. I remember once in my own life, there was a, a person who was very close to my family, like one of those that you grew up with type of things. And I had a lot of rapport with him, younger than me and all of that type of stuff. And, and it ended up being a situation where he was addicted to something that was causing his mother to lose thousands of dollars every month. I was like, when, by the time this came to me, I was furious. I know his mom very well. Um, I know him very well. And it's just a completely like indefensible situation. And so I'm rushing to make this phone call to this person. And I'm going to let him have it that type of big brother energy. That's what I'm coming with. But then I remember that hadith, Ar-Rahimun, Ar-Rahmuhum, Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahmuhum, man fil ardi, Ar-Rahmuhum, man fil sama. Have mercy on those who are on earth. The one who's in the heavens will have mercy on you. A lot of times we don't look at each other through the lens of mercy. So when people are messing up in life, we don't look at them through a lens of mercy. We look at through a lens of criticism. And then when we mess up, we want everybody to look at us through a lens of mercy. And so... Is, is that anybody's objective? Is anybody's objective in life to, to take thousands of dollars from their mom's purse? Absolutely not. Nobody starts off like that. Everybody hopes, inshallah ta'ala, that they're going to be an asset to their parents. They're not going to be a liability. And so instead, I called him, and my, my tone was completely different than what I was initially intending. It was all, alhamdulillah, like care and concern. Like, what's going on with you? Like, are you okay? Like the most important thing is for you to be okay and then the money will, the money will come, we'll figure that out. And so after we were able to get him help, you know, he sent me a text and he said, I just want to thank you for 
the way that you approached me more than the fact that you approached me. You didn't come with fire, but you came with, with care that ended up allowing us to better the situation. And alhamdulillah, he got better. The idea here is that the importance of kindness in everything <clears throat> and how kindness beautifies everything. Kindness beautifies everything. And so looking to add that into your interactions with everybody that you do. Yes, keep going. <clears throat> وَلَا يَغُرَّنْكَ حَظٌ جَرَّهُ خَرَقٌ فَالْخَرْقُ هَدْمُ وَرِفْقُ الْمَرْءِ بُنْيَانُ So he says, don't be distracted or don't be deluded by success that comes from foolishness. So the opposite of رِفْق, this idea of harshness, خُرْق, this idea of, of ignorance, so a person might point to it and be like, nah, but it works. Like, I'm harsh to my family, and they respect me. I'm harsh to my family, and they make things happen. I walk in the door, and nobody, there are no problems. Because I come with that, with that energy, that fire. Yeah, okay, don't be deluded by that, he says. Because at the end of the day, it's destruction. You take, you know, there are many places in the, in the, in the Muslim world, for example, where children are beat to learn the Qur'an. How successful is that as far as making kids love the Qur'an though? Yeah, you might be able to pump out huffad, you can fundraise with that. And, but don't we all know stories of kids who have memorized the Qur'an from cover to cover and they're the furthest thing away. And I'm not even talking about the people who completed hifth. How many are the kids in the Muslim world who are traumatized by their hifth experience? By going to schools and by going to these programs. And that's why it's so beautiful that a scholar was asked, should we be kids, this was a Moroccan scholar, he was asked, should we beat kids to teach them the Qur'an? And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ar-Rahmanu allam al-Qur'an. And he didn't say, Jabbaru allam al-Qur'an. Allah said, Ar-Rahman, the merciful is the one who taught the Qur'an. And he didn't say the Jabbar. And so when you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's the greatest builder, was he someone who, 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 his success was based on ignorance or was it based on the opposite, incredible rifq, incredible gentleness? The Prophet Sallallahu stories of gentleness are amazing. Even when people would, it's human nature and we're going to get to that. You have to realize that human beings are going to be human beings. They're going to be different. I'll give you an example, famous example. Aisha radiallahu anha, he's at the house of Aisha. And it's Aisha's, it's Aisha's day. She's taking care of the Prophet Sallallahu on that day and he has guests. And when he has guests, one of his other wives sends a meal over. Like it's a little bit of a, well, like, you know, Aisha doesn't know how to cook, so let me send you guys over some, let me send you guys some assistance. And Aisha radiallahu anha is, the prophet is there and the guest. And Aisha takes the plate and smashes it on the ground. Could you imagine an Arab man today, forget 1400 years ago, an Arab man today, or any man from, you know, and yet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi simply smiles at he guess and he says, Gharat ummukum. Your mother got jealous. Your mother got jealous. And then he commanded for the plate to be replaced and to be sent back. But he realized this is just a moment. Aisha didn't mean to disrespect him. Aisha didn't mean to disrespect the guest. This was an emotion that came over her. How you treat your spouse, how you treat children. A lot of times we're very short tempered when it comes to kids. Rasulullah, and again, last week I told you about the proofs of prophethood. The Prophet ﷺ being married to nine women is proof of prophethood to me. The way the Prophet ﷺ taught, he interacted with children, that's proof of prophethood. Anas ibn Malik who says, I served the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years, 10 years from the age of 10 to the age of 20. Do you know how much you clash with a 10 year old, an 11 year old, a 12 year old, a 13 year old, a 14 year old, a 15 year old? Like, you are confounded by them. There doesn't seem to be any logic to their actions. Why they do things. A lot of times you tell them to do something, they do the exact opposite. They come to you with excuses, they come to you with lies, they come to you with all sorts of things. And so Anas ibn Malik says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I served him for 10 years and never once, never once, did he tell me to do something and I didn't do it and he said to me, why didn't you do that? Or once that I did something and he told me, why did you do that? We ask our 10-year-olds why they did that like 20 times a day. And Anas says, for 10 years I was never asked by the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ shows incredible gentleness all of the time. 
and our author here, uh, Al Busti, he says that don't be deluded by any sort of success that comes from harshness, any sort of success that comes from vulgarity, because at the end of the day, it is destruction, and rift is that which constructs, it's that which builds. Tfadda Sidi. Ahsin idha kana imkanun wa maqudiratun falan yadu ma'ala al-ihsani imkanun. So he says, Ahsin. If you have the ability to do so, if you have the ability to be excellent to people, then do that. Because you don't know if it's going to last. You don't know if it's going to last. And there are lots of examples of that. If you have an opportunity to good, do a good deed today, you don't know if you're going to have that opportunity tomorrow. Pick an opportunity. The opportunity to be kind to your parents. How many a person is robbed of that opportunity when they get a phone call saying that their parent passed away? or the day comes that a parent passes away, خلاص, that door is closed. And then the other door is closed when the other parent passes away. I had the opportunity while I'm, they're alive for me to be in their service, for me to be in their company, more importantly. And I don't have that opportunity after it's closed. So take advantage of it. Take advantage of your youth while you have your youth. This is the opportunity for you to, 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 to volunteer and to gain knowledge and to study and to serve and to do all of these types of things. You have the opportunity to study under a particular scholars while those scholars are alive, while those scholars are in your city, while they're available and accessible to you. And then after they pass away or after they leave, you don't have that opportunity anymore. Opportunities present themselves and they're always a limited time only. So take advantage of the opportunity of a lifetime within the lifetime of that opportunity. That is uh, ET. But anyway, um, it's about taking advantage of opportunities while they're available. Okay? Fadlam. فَالرَّوْضُ يَزْدَانُ بِالْأَنْوَارِ فَاغِمَةً وَالْحُرُّ بِالْعَادْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ يَزْدَانُ So he says, a road. A road is a garden. And it is beautified by flowers in bloom. بِالْأَنْوَارِ Anwar is the plural of nawr. And nawr is a flower. So gardens are beautified by flowers when they're in bloom. But what is, a, what is a, a, a hur, a free man? But we said that hur here doesn't mean free man, it means a noble person. What is a noble man beautified by? He's not beautified by clothes and garments and, 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 and wealth and cards and things like that. That's not what beautifies a person, specifically a man. What beautifies a man is their character. It is their, their, their dignity. It is their... It is their attributes. And he says, وَالْحُرُّ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ And for him, he's mentioning two qualities. Number one is their excellence to others. And number two is their justice. That is what beautifies a man. And then he says, وَصُنْ وَجْحَكَ Did you read that? Go ahead. No, I haven't. سُنْ حُرَّ وَجْهِكَ لَا تَهْتِكْ غِلَالَ لَا تَهْتِكْ لَا تَهْتِكْ غِلَالَ تَهُ and he says, protect the countenance of your face. Don't tear its veal. For every noble person is protective of their face. So what does that mean? It's the idea even in English of what we say of saving face. Save your own face. Save your own face by not asking people a lot. Not developing the habit of always asking people. No matter how kind and gentle a person is, no matter how well they are, like how... how how kind they are. People get exhausted by a person who's always asking. On day one, you see this friend of yours and they say to you, hey, can I get a ride home? You're like, sure. Day number two, they're like, can I get a ride home? Sure. Day number three, can I get a ride home? Sure. Day number four, each time it's out of your way. Each time it's out of your way. Each time it's out of your way. By day number five, you're gonna park your car two blocks away. And then when they say to you, can I get a ride home? You're like, man, I'm hoping both of us are able to get a ride home tonight. Person comes every time you see them, they're asking you for a dollar. It's not a lot, but it's a dollar. Just being asked, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. If a person protects themselves from asking others, a person may be able to put themselves in a position of such dignity that if they ever ask, it makes it seem like they're the ones who are doing you a favor. I'll give you an example. Back in the day, I used to attend the halaqa of a friend of mine. He was a sheikh even though he was just a year older than us. He was a friend and a sheikh. 
And we used to attend his halaqa. He was probably like 18 years old at the time. And he was 19, and the people that were attending the halaqa were all our ages, 20, 21, 22, 23. But you know, for a 23-year-old to come and attend the halaqa of a 19-year-old, it's a big deal. And so we always attend his halaqa, hafizhullah ta'ala. And he never, ever, he didn't have a car. He would, take the, he would take like two buses and a train to get to the class. And everybody else had cars, but he would never, ever let anybody give him a ride home. And he's the one who's giving the halqa. Everybody wanted to give him a ride home. He's like, no, no, he's good. And every week, people would be like, yo, can we give you a ride home? He's like, no, I'm, I'm good. And he had like some little nursery rhyme he would say, like if your feet will get you there, then there's no need for you to get a ride or something like that. He had some sort of... But I remember one time, he asked me, he says, do you mind giving me a ride home? I was like, of course. I'm the one doing him, I'm giving him the ride. But guess what? It was so rare, and I know that he was so particular about this, I felt like I was the one who was receiving the favor. A person can be so dignified that even when they ask, it seems like they're the ones who are extending the, the favor to the ones who's receiving it. And that's the idea. So he says, but, but that comes through incredible guarding. It comes through inc incredible guarding. And that is the nature of the noble. They don't ask. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That there are people who an ignorant person would think that they are wealthy because of how much iffa they have, how much dignity they have. They're broke and they have no money and their car's broken and, you know, they're having trouble make rent and all that type of stuff. And you ask them, Salaam alaikum, how are you doing? They're like, Alhamdulillah, everything's great. How are you doing? And you're like, I'm doing good. And they start asking about you. And they're concerned about you. Is there anything I can do to help? Blah, blah, blah. And you have no idea that they're going through such incredible hardship. Their dignity, their ifa. But what that inspires of us and what that should require of us also is that you are sensitive to the needs of your brother. Don't ever put them in a position where they, they need to ask you. Try to be sensitive to their needs. Try to anticipate people's needs. If I hear that my brother or sister, for example, lost their job, I shouldn't wait until two months go by or three months go by until he starts actually you know, calling me to ask. I, let me proceed their asking and see if, if I can be of any sort of help. Right? They're going through some sort of difficulty. Anticipating people's needs as best as you can. And you know what else helps a person do that? Is again, uh, visiting people. When you visit people, for the sake of Allah, you get to see people's circumstances. You get to become more aware of how people are living. You have to get to be more aware. It's an added level of vulnerability that that person is showcasing to you. You don't see that at Starbucks together. You'll never understand that. You'll never be able to recognize that if you're eating at a restaurant. But when you actually visit each other for the sake of Allah, you get a deeper glimpse at people's, people's lives. Yes. Keep going. So he says, and so if you meet an enemy, meet them forever with a face with joy and cheerfulness and radiance. And leave laziness regarding any goodness you're seeking, for the lazy never get to enjoy the fruits of their work. So that cheerfulness that he was telling us about earlier, he's saying it's not just for the people that you like, but even your enemies meet them with that cheerfulness. Even with your enemies meet them with that smile. Even with your enemies meet them with that good character. Why? Because it's as if he's, he's referring to the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا سَيِّئَةُ in Surah Fussilat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the good and the evil are not the same. Repel with that which is greater. And if you do so, perhaps the one who between you and them is enmity may turn into a loving protector. You can win an enemy over with good character. And we see example after example after example after example of that with the life of the Prophet wasallam. These companions of his, many of them were enemies. And yet, they had moments with the Prophet ﷺ that eventually captured their hearts. Or when they're looking back at all of their interactions with the Prophet ﷺ, they see a consistency of character that, that, that compels them to eventually submit. 
But again, that doesn't come with meeting fire with fire. You continue to show goodness to those who show harm to you or show enmity to you. Itfa' billati hasan, with repel with that which is greater. And then he says, and avoid laziness. Avoid laziness. Because no one is able to capture the goodness they're seeking with laziness. And laziness is something that Rasulullah used to seek refuge in Allah from. In the morning, he would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika wa a'udhu bika min al ajzi wal kasal. This is a dua that the Prophet Sallallahu would make in his mornings. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from two things, ajz and kasal. Ajz, both of them are inability. But ajz is an inability that comes from physical inability. I might have all of them in, 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 I might have all of the motivation in the world, but I just don't have the ability to do it. I want to do this, but I can't. And it's not just physical inability, but it's, it's just not being able to actualize something that you want. You have the motivation, but you don't have the means or you don't have the ability. But kasal is a, a, mod, a, a lack of motivation. It is a laziness that comes from lack of motivation. I might have the ability to do things. I might have the resources to do things. I might have the access to do things, but I don't have the motivation to do it. And the Prophet Sallallahu used to seek refuge in Allah in the mornings from kasal, from laziness, as if he's... What do you seek refuge from? You seek refuge from something that's going to harm you. You seek refuge from shaitan. You seek refuge from a, a, a pest. A, a creature, a serpent. That's what you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from. And he is seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from laziness, like laziness is this thing that's going to debilitate him or something that's going to harm him. And laziness does. That's what laziness does. And so nobody who's lazy enjoys the fruits of their work. <laughs> وَإِنْ أَظَلَّتْهُ أَوْرَاقٌ وَأَفْنَانٌ وَالنَّاسُ أَعْوَانٌ مَنْ وَالَتْهُ دَوْلَتُهُ وَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ إِذَا عَادَتْهُ أَعْوَانٌ So he says there's no honor for a man other than taqwa and intellect, even if they were to be shaded in branches and leaves. So it's a play on words, it's hard to translate, but he says there's no dhil, there's no honor, but dhil also means shade. So he says there's no honor or shade for a person other than taqwa, even if they were to be shaded in branches and leaves. So even if they're sitting in an orchard somewhere and there's shade, if they don't have the shade of taqwa, then they don't really have shade, i.e. honor or dignity. And then he says, and people assist those whose dunya has arrived and they're against them if that dunya subsides. So number one, the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the libas of taqwa, the garment of taqwa is the best thing that a person can wear. As much as we care about what we wear when we go out into this world, the best thing that a person can adorn themselves with is taqwa, consciousness of God, awareness of God, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the best thing that you can go out into this world with. That's number one. And then number two, he says, and this is a reality. He's talking about this a thousand years ago. He died in 401 after the hijrah. He says, people are on your side as long as the dunya is on your side. If the dunya is on your side, things are rolling for you right now, you happen to have money. If you've got money, you've got a lot of yes men around you. You've got a lot of supporters around you. You've got a lot of people who are, who are, who are, are trying to, if you're hot, there are a lot of people who are standing next to you trying to keep warm. But if it turns away from you, then guess what they're going to do too? They're going to turn away from you. They're going to leave you. They're going to scatter. In fact, he said they might turn against you. But what about my loyal folks? What about my rider dies? What about what happened to that? He's like, you have to understand the nature of people. That's the nature of people. If you've got wealth, then you're going to have a lot of people around you. If you don't have wealth, you're not going to have a lot of people around you. And so understanding that nature helps you Number one, not be deluded by your moments where you do have wealth, where you do have success. You don't be deluded by that. Uh, Rudyard Kipling in his poem, If, it's an amazing poem. It's an amazing poem. He says, um, if you can keep your wits when all about you are blaming theirs and losing, if you can keep your wits when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. 
If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, not give way to hating, nor look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream, but not make dreams your master. Like dream, but don't make dreams your master. Don't sit there and dream forever. Like put it to, put it to, put it to work. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat both imposters just the same. That's the point here. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat both imposters just the same. If I meet with triumph, I'm even keeled. I don't let the success go to my head. And if I meet with failure, I'm also even keeled. I don't let the failure destroy me. I, treat, I recognize both of them to be imposters and I treat them just the same. And when I have the dunya and things are going well for me and I've got people around me clapping for me and all of that type of stuff, number one, I don't get deluded by that wealth and I don't get deluded by their yeses. I don't get deluded by their yeses. Everyone is saying, yeah, you should do that. Yeah, you should do that. No, I try to find, and that's why he's going to talk next about friendship. You're going to need, to, you're going to need people around you who are truly sincere to you. And then number two, I don't get broken by the fact that when the dunya separates from me, that all of these people around me that I thought were ride or dies are going to leave. That's the nature of the dunya. That's the nature of people. I've seen sometimes some uh, ulama who got imprisoned. And when they got imprisoned, you barely saw anybody tweet about them or anything like that. And then when they came out, because they were so popular, when they come out, hordes of people are all greeting them. Hordes. Everybody's shaking their hand and kissing them and all that. I'm like, man, where was all of this love when they were imprisoned? That's the nature of the dunya. That's the way that it goes. That's the nature of people. Yes. Sahbanu min ghayri malin baqilun hasirun wa baqilun fi thara'il mali sahbanu la tudi'i sirra wa sha'an yabuhu bihi fama ra'a ghanaman fi addawi sirhanu so he gives, he's continuing on his point and he says, Sahban, the eloquent without wealth, is like Baqir the dumb. These are two examples in Arabic literature who were considered to be examples in their fields. Sahban was an example in his eloquence. He was untouched in his eloquence. And Baqir is an example in his inability to talk. So he says, Sahban without wealth is like Baqir. Sahban without wealth, the most eloquent guy. If he's got no money, nobody wants to hear what he has to say. Or nobody can hear what he has to say. And Baqil, if he's got money, man, everybody's listening. Everybody's listening. If Baqil tells a joke, everybody laughs. Because he has money. If Baqil cries, everybody cries. Because he has money. I have a friend of mine, not a friend, this is a cousin of mine. I remember we were young at the time. He was like maybe early 20s. This was in our village in Sudan. And he had, uh, there was a marriage that was happening. And it was happening to, I think, one of his close relatives. And he was a passionate young guy, and he had an opinion on this wedding. And he didn't want it to happen. And so he's calling one of the, the uncles. He's calling one of the uncles, and he's like, I don't think this wedding should happen, and this, and this, and this, and this. And the uncle said to him, listen, do you have any money to help this wedding or not? And he said, he said, no, I don't have any money. Like, I'm, I'm participating with my opinion. He's like, keep your opinion to yourself. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, if you don't have any money, your opinion is not free. Keep that opinion to yourself. So then he called and he was like, I've learned today that if you don't have money, your opinion doesn't count. I was like, yes, that's exactly what it goes. That's the nature of human beings. Allah knows best. He says, don't place your secret with someone who's loose-lipped, for a livestock is not shepherded in a wolf's den. Don't place your secret with someone who's loose-lipped for livestock isn't shepherded in a wolf's den. If a secret is, is, is spread by you, Imam al-Shafi'i says, he says, if you share your own secret with your own tongue, then blame someone else, then you're a fool depicted. If your own chest was too narrow to restrain your own secret, the chest of the one you entrust is even more constricted. It's the way that it goes. So if you, especially if you know that that person is the type that shares secrets, you go to somebody who can't keep a secret and you're like, listen, I've got something amazing to share with you, but you can't tell anybody. And they're sitting there jittering and they're like, okay. You're like, bro, by the time you get up, that's already on Instagram <clears throat> or on, on WhatsApp somewhere. So it's, it's, 
It's, he says, don't give it to somebody who's loose-lipped. Don't give your secrets. Keep your secrets to yourself, especially, especially, especially what goes on between you and your spouse. When it leaves the bedroom, it gets bigger. When it leaves the bedroom, it gets bigger. When it leaves the living room, it gets bigger. When it leaves your house, oh man, it becomes very hard for you to, to bring back. Unless it's someone who he's going to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, people who have certain characteristics, people who are very wise, people who are very caring, people who are very action-oriented. Keep going. لا تحسب الناس طبعا واحدا فلهم غرائز لست تحصيهن ألوان ما كل ما إن كصدى لوارده نمع على كل نبات فهو سعدان. Okay, so we'll, we'll end with this one then. We won't get to the friends in the consultation part. We'll save that for last next week, inshallah. But he, he basically says, don't consider all people to be of the same nature. A lot of disappointment comes from comparison. They say comparison is the thief of joy. So some people, some people, you treat well, أَحْسِنْ إِلَى nas تَسْتَعْبِدْ قُلُوبَهُمُ Right, that's what he began with. Be good to people and you will, you will enslave their hearts. Guess what? There are some people who you will be the best to. And you won't capture their hearts at all. In fact, they'll see your kindness as weakness. And they will criticize you in public. And they won't appreciate anything that you did. Or you might be good to them for years and years and years. And all that does, it doesn't increase them in gratitude. It only increases them in expectation. It only increases them in entitlement. Don't treat or think that people's natures are all the same. People are as varied as, as, as the colors are, he says. But what that teaches you is that teaches you to be like water when it comes to people. It teaches you to just... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take what is given freely. You know what take what is given freely of the, of, of the tafsir of that? Is just take what people give you. This person will, will barely give you a thank you, take that from them. This person will give you profuse gratitude and encouragement and all of that, you take that from them. But don't, don't be too attached to how people respond to what you do. And don't be too attached to, to trying to mold people into being something that they're not. Recognize that there are people's diver that people are diverse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to be like that. And when you realize that, then you'll be able to appreciate them for the good that they have, as opposed to trying to mold them into something that they're not. Okay? So we'll end with that, inshaAllah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala sahbi sallam